The theme for this discussion is leveraging mentorship for career success, and we're joined by three talented experts today. Chatsani Williams-West is the Assistant Vice President of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging at Adelphi University. Davon Patterson is the Director of Community Engagement at Open Buffalo. And Angel Roman is the Director of Professional Development at the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development. I now pass the mic to our moderator and my colleague, Joey Gollum, Director of Programs and Partnership Development at Mentor New York. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Great, thank you so much, Sam. And I am once again so honored and delighted to be joined by these fabulous panelists for this conversation. Um, I really love how we're doing this. The first session, you're know, really talking to some the employers, the corporate sector, and then talking to you all who are maybe even a little bit more, you know, closer to the young people and the youth, and thinking about um, what do they really need, you know, in this in this moment um, to advance their career opportunities, expand their networks and their possibilities. Um, so I'd love to just pass it to each of you. We gave your title, we gave where you work, but why don't you share with uh, the folks on the call here today um, a little bit more about your experience and the relevancy of your work to this conversation. And I can pass it first uh, to Chitsani to get us started. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with you, Joey, Sam, uh, Cassie, and my esteemed um, colleagues on the panel. Um, I think that my, my work really within the um, workspace and working with young people has everything to do with what was mentioned in the opening to help fill the gaps that exist um, within the workplace in terms of how our young people are learning, how they're growing and thriving. And so I've always dedicated my career to um, their success and success for um, students looks different for different students, depending on how they show up in the world. And so my work really revolves around um, asking students about what it is that they um, are interested in, in learning more about and how I can support that, that growth. And then um, working with my colleagues to ensure that we are all speaking the same language to let our students know that we are here for them, um, we're accessible, and we are looking forward to working with them to fulfill their, their greatest potential. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Angel, do you want to jump in? Sure. Uh, first of all, to Joy and to Sam, thank you for the opportunity of, of having me this afternoon. And again, to my esteemed colleagues on the panel, Davon and, and Chotsani. I'm Angel Lewis Roman. I work at the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development. Uh, for the last, I want to say about 10 plus years, I was director of the WIOA uh, Train and Earn Out of School Youth Program, uh, which is a, a network of community based providers that offer job training and placement services for opportunity youth who are out of school and out of work uh, between the ages of 16 to 24. Recently, we've had a restructuring of all of our workforce programs. And as of the beginning of this year, I started a new role as Director of Professional Development. And in that capacity, I get to collaborate with all of our youth workforce programs to manage and coordinate uh, professional development and TA activities for the staff who work with our young adults in our program. So uh, we want to ensure that all of our youth workforce programs have uh, equity, inclusion, and, and access uh, for all of our young adults between the ages of 14 to 24, whether they're in school or not in school. That's perfect. Thank you. And Devon. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Dave Owen Patterson, Director of Community Engagement at Open Buffalo. Uh, I first started at Open Buffalo as a youth organizer. So um, I oversaw and supported our youth program of 14 and 24 year olds. Um, it was a youth led initiative uh, program, allowing the young folks to um, create the pathways and uh, direct me where they wanted to go. Um, and now I I've now been promoted to Director of Community Engagement in my current role. Um, I do all of our forward facing work with the community and also over uh, offer support to our youth program in their efforts for uh, campaigning for some of our children. I'm also the supervisor for our recidivism program in partnership with Berkshire Farms. So um, I've hired three credible messengers and two parent partners to help uh, up to 15 young folks within the 120 days in facility or outside of facility. Um, get back on track, get uh, get jobs, get back in school, 
And then I'm a co-chair for the Youth Employment Coalition here in Buffalo. So as a direct, um, direct to what we are talking about today for career success, um, helping implement uh, the first of its kind, a, a, a hub to offer technical support for young folks to actually get certifications, trainings, and what they may need for career waging jobs. Um, and it's specific for opportunity youth that are not in school and not currently working. So thank you. Wow, so we have such an incredible panel here. There's so much to get into. Um, I wanna start, one of the things that particularly interested me that I think I mentioned to both of you in our calls before um, in coming to this conversation was, and I, we actually, there's a question sort of semi-related to this in the chat that um, I'm gonna try to include in this which is this idea that the landscape of workforce is, is ever changing right before us. I think we've always had this challenge with young people where it's hard sometimes for young people to, um, to see themselves in the workforce. You know, where do I belong? Where do I fit in? How do I um, use my skills? Um, but then there's this added challenge where even where we are as professionals, and adults, it's like, what is workforce even going to look like? What are careers going to even look like in 10 years time? We have um, this advancement of technology, artificial intelligence, all of these things that are being talked about all the time, and it's sort of unknown. So I'm curious, um, the chat is specifically asking about sort of this, uh, this importance of training young people in these new developing areas. But I'm also curious, you know, are there other challenges that you're seeing with young people? What are the challenges, the top challenges right now, you know, that we're seeing with young people as they're looking to navigate the workplace um, and find, find their footing in this way that might be unique from what we've seen in years past? Um, anyone want to take that? Angel, I see you nodding. Do you want to jump in? Sure. Um... In preparing for today's panel, I, I came up with something that the YES Project had generated. They're uh, affiliated with an organization called America's Promise Alliance, and they did a, a study back in the spring of 21 uh, titled The State of Youth Employment, and they had five particular findings as a result of that study. And one of the, one of the findings that I want to share, which is very sobering, it says the professional connections and supportive relationships that can help young people advance their work-related goals are out of reach for most youth. So this is a problem because if we're not in, in a capacity of being able to provide resources and training and mentorship programs and DEI initiatives for young adults, obviously they're not going to be fully participating in the workforce. So it's really important that when we do mentoring initiatives, DEI initiatives, uh, training apprenticeship programs, that we make sure that we um, integrate uh, policies and programs so we can attract a greater amount of young people and increase the talent pool uh, of young adults in our workforce. You know, in a couple of years, I'm going to be retiring from city government, and I want to make sure that, uh, you know, we have young adults that are ready, willing, and prepared to come on and take the baton uh, for the next generation of leaders. I can piggyback off of uh, Angel. Um, in my experience, what we're noticing is that, uh, that uh, like you said, they're, the young folks are not seeing themselves in these positions. So the, the disconnect, the culture and the atmosphere is hard for them to continue. And let alone, you got to think if we're talking about opportunity youth, their experience growing up is, you know, what's the J.G. Wetworth commercial? It's my money, I need it now. It's, you know, it's that kind of mentality. It's like, I can go get money quick and easy you know, around the block real quick. Um, why do I need to listen to somebody kind of chastise me and scold me on things that I'm doing? It's just not up to their standard and their caliber. Um, so it's that disconnect of soft skills. It's the intentionality of how we are uh, mentoring our young, for, uh, young folks and offering them support systems so that they, uh, they're not set up for failure when they actually get in front of their employers. Bonnie, did you wanna add anything? Or I did. I was inspired by um, what Angel and Devon mentioned. I think um, going back to the notion of being transparent, we can let young people know that we didn't just arrive to the to the roles that we hold now, um, but that we understand their experiences. Some of some of us have lived their their um, 
their current experiences. And, and if we have not, it's important to connect young people to people that, that will be willing to share their stories. And so um, listening to a person whom you've never met, you know, it makes it a little easier when you have a connection that you're making to, to, the, to the young people that you're introducing them to. Um, and I think that it just, um, humanizes the person to whom you're reporting, right? And and not just a, a supervisor, not just a manager, but someone who is willing to listen to where you are currently, where you hope to be one day, and then how can we in partnership work toward you getting to that place? Um, so that's all I would add. That's great. Yeah. I, and I, you know, I started on sort of this dour note in terms of the challenges, but I think it, it, it lifts up a lot of opportunity here. Right. You know, and um, so I'd be curious, Devon, to, um, to for you to kick us off. But um, as we think about some of these these essential things of elevating youth voice, really um, seeing them, hearing them, including them at the table, which we talked a lot about in the last panel, mentorship, these diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging initiatives that are happening, listening, Chasani, like you said, really honoring lived experience and also having those relationships where adults like us can share those lived experiences and reflect and really honor. And there is that kind of cultural connection um, to seeing young people as well. Are there other um, promising practices, Devon, that you've seen or that you've been able to implement or um, work towards that's really helping to, um, to challenge some of those initial attitudes or, you know, uh, or perspectives that young people might have where they're feeling, you know, not seen in that way and it's harder for them to navigate and come into this space? Um, I don't, I wouldn't per se say challenge. I would say support. Um, like, um, correct me if I'm saying your name wrong, Chosani. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, like Chosani said, um, it's listening and it's, the, it's the avid listening. It's that intentionality when you're listening to understand the, their experiences and how they, you know, their upbringing. And like, it was also mentioned, like some people have also lived their experiences. So it's, offering them support and making them feel validated like yes you are capable yes your experience has been rocky but those setbacks and obstacles and roller coasters have put you to this point where you are very well prepared for anything that comes at you if you just navigate your mind to work towards or work through it right all of your experiences are relatable to what you're going to go through in the workforce it's just a matter of how you navigate it and i think in our experience and all of the areas that now i'm now excuse me, that I am now in, it's uh, how to understand your intentionality when engaging with young folks and then offering them the utmost support and not just the way you walk, or not the way you talk, but in your actions as well. Yeah. I would also wanna add uh, to what Davon was saying about you know the intentionality of employers. Uh, uh, there was a, a terrific research that was done 20 years ago, which can probably speak to today, and maybe some of you on the call might have heard of, of the titles research. It was done by the National Bureau of Economic Research, and the title of the study was called, Are Emily and Greg More Employable uh, Than Lakeisha and Jamal? They, and it was a field experiment on labor market uh, discrimination. And then, unfortunately, to say that some of the results showed that there was a significant discrimination against African American uh, names uh, during the job search process. It says white names receive 50% more callbacks for interviews. We also found that race affects the benefits of a better re of, of a better resume. And it says for white names, a higher quality resume elicits 30% more callbacks, whereby for African Americans, it's it's a, it's a smaller uh, percentage, unfortunately. So I think what employers and organizations need to do today is to uh, integrate what are called blind hiring practices. And I know companies and corporations have been doing this for the last couple of years. But what I mean by blind hiring is in order to attract a more wide and diverse talent pool is to include things like asking people not to put names on resumes, not to put you know, a zip code, uh, probably no need to include what college they went to or where did they graduate from. Uh, and this can help focus uh, interviewers and HR recruiters on the specific skill sets of the individuals that are applying for jobs. Um, and we're getting there. We still have a lot of work to do in that area, but I think we've made a lot of progress in that. Uh, and also there's some things going now that 
organizations are doing around AI software, there's something called that I found I call gap jumpers, which identifies and eliminates things that could elicit implicit and unconscious bias uh, during the onboarding and recruitment process. Thank you. Thanks, and Angel, thank you for bringing these studies and these statistics and oh, yeah. this research. It's really I'm a great. little bit of a research geek, so it's the oh. academic guy in me. <laughs> I love it. And and Chitsani, did you want to? Yeah. I was just going to thank you, Angel, for for sharing the um, those particular case studies because they are very real, and I think it oh. it really brings home the point that we are um, talking about and looking at the value that Jamal and Lakeisha bring to the table, right? Um, the, the piece about intentionality that Devon raised is extremely important. I think the mindset of an institution has to be something that is um, executed and, and heard out loud. So it's one thing to put practices into place and, and policy, but then how are the people who are developing those policies and strategies working intentionally um, to keep them going and to sustain them. So while we can um, employ um, a diverse workforce, it's really important for us to think about how we are retaining them. You know, what is the um, experience like once they are in the workspace? And what are we doing to honor people's identities, right? So if we are talking about names or pronouns or preferred names, how are we using those, those terms consistently um, and not just during the onboarding process, right? How are we asking um, our young people what work-life balance would be helpful for them? And so let's say they are, are at home and they are a part of the caregiving team for an older adult in the home. If a student or a young person is letting you know that Tuesdays, for example, is the day that they are responsible for this work, um, how do you create a, a space for that coverage to be met where the student doesn't feel pressure for asking to take Tuesday off or an earlier day? And so when we look at a diverse workplace environment and then the intentionality behind it, I think you know policy is important practices are important, but then how do you encourage um, the people who are in power to make decisions? How do we challenge their mindset to be such that it is a consistent theme that they're threading through um, while working with the people who they're bringing um, into their space? Um, and then another thing that you mentioned just really inspires the whole idea around the culture of the, the agency or the institution, right? Is, is mentoring a part of the ethos? Is it something that everyone feels a, a collective responsibility for? Because if that's the case, then we're all speaking the same language. We, we are all creating um, an opportunity for young people to say, these are my needs and, and, and how can we work together so that I can thrive and be my best, um, be my best self while I'm here. Right, because they, you're removing any potential barriers for them to have to choose. And so I really appreciate um, the study that you brought forth and, and the, the data that supports what it is that we need to be thinking about in terms of how we, we elevate young people in the workplace. That's wonderful. And we could continue this conversation. There's so much here, but we are very close to time. I just want to follow up, finish with one question for each of you. Um, and believe me, I am I am on the side of I am all in favor of the policies have to change, the people in power, the employers. We need to create these cultures and these systems. But thinking about the diverse range of um, audience members that we have with us today and a lot of our work with Mentor New York, thinking about how youth workers, um, mentors um, can do work directly with young people um, while we're instilling mentoring mindsets in the employers, in these corporate or workforce settings. Do you have um, takeaways or thoughts for our, for our youth workers, for our educators, for our mentors about little nuggets of, of hope or inspiration or tactical things that you tell young people as they're you know, coming into the workforce now, and maybe those cultures aren't set for them, or they have to navigate these relationships and build these networks, you know, to really advance them. What are some things that have been sort of sticking to you most recently in your mind that you've been um, sharing with young people that might be helpful for our for our mentors to hear? 
Anyone want to kick us off? <clears throat> so I guess what I've been reiterating over and over and over to the young folks is um, to be patient, um, to treat all of the situations in their employer like I'm there with them. I'm um, thinking specifically of three young men that um, are part of the youth group that sometimes call me dad. Like, you know, it's just, it's a fun thing for them. But like, for me, it's just think of me being there and I'm there to like the, you know, comfort you in that situation. And I, I feel like, you know, they all have pretty good jobs right now. They're doing well. So I think that's the tidbit from, for me is to just um to help the young folks just feel comfortable, supported and valued. Yeah, I would, you know, I like to share with young adults, especially with young adults that, you know, might be, you know, living in marginalized households or communities or neighborhoods. It's like, you know, even though you, that might be the experience that you're going through now, that's not the experience, that's not the, the experience or the lay of the land that defines you as a person, that you have options, whether you want to go to school or job training or the military or, or you know, an apprenticeship program, you have options and to connect with adults who uh, show a genuine uh, interest uh, to help you develop your skills and your interests and values. I can't tell you when I was in graduate school, the profound effect that one of my graduate school professors had in me, Puerto Rican kid from Brooklyn. I didn't think I was going to go to grad school, let alone graduate from college. And he mentored me and worked with me and, and gave me the opportunity to be his teaching assistant in one of his graduate classes. So, you know, those experiences are helpful, but, you know, we need more of those uh, types of experiences with young people so they can see that they can, that they can do this and they may experience challenges and obstacles like we all do, but that they can press forward and that there are a lot of caring adults out there that have their best interests at heart. I love that. I, I often say that, and it's not always exactly stated this way, but it's for me, it's just a privilege and an honor to be in the passenger seat of their, of their journey, right? So, you know, their job is to lead me to where it is that they see themselves and, and how can I support that? And so because each person's journey is so unique, I'm just so grateful that they trust me enough to share what it is that they are dreaming about. And no dream is too far away or unattainable. And so I have said that um, in different ways throughout my career. And I just feel that when young people come back and they share their, their testimony about whatever it was that we have said to inspire them, it's just, for me, there's, there's nothing like it. And so, if I can be in the passenger seat and, and get them to wherever it is that they aspire to go, that, that, that's it for me. And I think that if we all think of it in those terms, because young people know what they need, um, but we just, we have to support them and how they get there, how they navigate their way there. Well, I, I love that we are leaving on this note. We often talk about at Mentor New York, a big um, tenet of our work is about uh, making spaces of joy, bringing joy to young people. I think you all spoke to that beautifully today, that it um, in terms of the, being overwhelmed by this, but that we can bring joy, we can see these young people, and we can be passengers on their journey. So thank you all so much. I'm so appreciative of your time, your expertise, your perspectives on this call. Um, if the chat has other questions, we'll be sure to be in touch so we can we can bring those questions to you. But thank you so much. We really appreciate you all.